Hey everyone, and welcome back to CTF Cookbook. In this video, I want to cover an essential tool for solving Pwn CTF challenges, and that is a debugger. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be giving a super brief tour of GDB with the extension Pwn Debug. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the most common commands. Uh, again, this isn't enough to be an expert in the tool. It's hopefully just enough that you can start using it, start learning, start asking questions, and know a couple of basic commands to kind of poke around and have fun. Uh, this is the, the binary we're going to be inspecting. Uh, we're not really going to be solving a challenge. Really, I just want to get into the debugger and start poking around uh, and see what it's all about. Uh, so we have a main function here that's going to define some different variables. It's going to do a puts and a gets. Uh, then it's going to call func1. Uh, it's going to define another buffer, do some puts, gets, and puts. Uh, if you're new to debuggers, uh, debuggers are a very critical tool for software development. They allow you to inspect the running process. Um, and so we can see things like register, stack layout, um, all the juicy details. Um, and let's get started. So unfortunately, because uh, there's a lot of information in a debugger, uh, the text has to be very small. So I'll do my best to zoom in. Uh, we're going to do gdb slash chow to launch it. Um, and then the first command we're going to do is break. So as part of a debugger, you can set breakpoints. And basically, that's going to tell the process to run until it hits a certain point, a certain condition. Um, we're going to set our first breakpoint. And you do that by just saying break and then main. So we're going to stop as soon as the main function starts executing. To start the process, you type run. And the program is off. And so the program ran until the main function, and then it stopped right at the main function. So this is the main interface. Again, if you're new to this, this is a lot. Uh, <laughs> it takes a while to get used to this, but really, you don't have to know everything. You just We're going to talk about the layout. Um, and over time, all of this will make sense. We're going to be covering GDB in a lot of different videos. Uh, so you'll kind of pick up key components. And then hopefully, after solving a number of challenges, this will just kind of be a, a native sort of feel. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the different panels. Uh, probably the easiest panel uh, is right here. Um, so this panel shows us our source code. So very nice, GDB is showing us that we are executing this line right here. So we're about to assign the value 13 into a variable called first. Super cool. Right above that panel is the assembly. So obviously the C code, when we compile it, it gets converted into assembly. And this is it. So right now we're assigning 13 to first. We can see the assembly code for that is move the value OXD, which is 13, uh, into the address of RBP minus 8. So we've kind of hinted at this RBP and RSP a little bit, but basically these are the two stack pointers. And this is where you store all those local variables in a function. And so they're offsetting the uh, a variable based off of RBP, uh, and then getting that address, and then moving 13 into that address. Um, above there, we have the registers. So these are the variables, I guess, that a CPU uses. Um, these are highly efficient. And the, this is how the CPU pretty much does all of its math. It does its operations. Um, anytime it needs to do something, it first loads it into a register. And then it'll do some calculation. And then it stores it somewhere. Um, so we have the four common registers, RA, X, RBX, RCX, and RDX. Then we have the, they can be used as general purpose, but normally you see them also with strings. So this is the destination index, uh, and this is the source index. Then we have the numerical registers. Again, just general purpose registers. You can do whatever you want with them. Then we have RBP. This is the base pointer. And RSP, this is the stack pointer. So the RBP is usually pointing to the base of the stack frame for that function. Um, and then we have the RSP, and this is the top of the stack. Next, we have our IP. This is our instruction pointer, and this is what is currently being executed. So right now, we are executing on at this address, uh, which is also known as main plus 12. And this is the instruction we saw earlier. It is moving the contents of 13 into this address, which is on the stack. One thing that makes uh, Pwn Debug, the extension on GDB, so useful is, one, it shows us this interface, but two, it also highlights everything. Uh, and it also does something called telescoping. So it'll look at the data and kind of intelligently decide what it is and give us a sneak peek. So normally you would only see this number if you were just using GDB. But since we're using Pwn Debug on top of it, it'll actually show us what the assembly is at that location. Uh, same with this. It's going to do some telescoping. So it's going to see this This is a stack address. Uh, it's highlighted yellow. And we have a little legend up here. So we can see RSP is a stack address, which makes sense. It's a stack pointer, which is pointing to another stack address, which is then pointing to this, uh, which is the string x86-64. So that is the architecture we're running on. Um, and yeah, just a lot of useful stuff. We can see we have another stack pointer here, stack pointer here, pointing to here. Uh, it looks like maybe we have some sort of function here, um, another function here. Um, so super cool stuff. 
There's also two panels left. Uh, the next panel is the stack. Um, so right here we have the stack. We can see there's an RSP and an RBP. So this is the end of the function frame. Um, so everything above here is being used by the function. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the stack in a bit. And then here is the list of stack frames. So this is every function that gets called gets a stack frame and they're just put right on top of each other. And so we can see if we were to go down the stack even further, we would see a stack frame for this function, for this function, for this function, and this function. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much the panels. So next I wanna cover a couple of common instructions and kind of step through things just to get a feel and that'll pretty much be it. So to step through, uh, there's a couple different commands. Uh, there's single step, uh, so you can type in S I enter and it steps just one, uh, one assembly instruction. Um, and so we can see we were executing this line and now the pointer has moved to this line. So now that this line is executed, we can take a look. And so it moved the value OXD into this address. So we can actually go down to the stack down here and now we see an OXD. So this variable is the long or the first variable. And so it now contains that value. We can also print out first, P first, so print first. And we can see it is equal to 13. You can also print out the address of first since we compiled with uh, debug information. We get all the symbols, uh, like first and second. We can print out the address, we say P and first, and first is at this address. Super cool. If we wanted to inspect it, we could say, give me the hex value at this address. So I'm gonna say X slash X. So this is the examine. Things get a little bit complex, but after a while, these just become muscle memory. So examine in hex at that address. And we press enter and we get oh, 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 D, so 13. <laughs> um, we can also just say, if we want a single byte, we can say examine the character at this address and we get 13, so super cool. So we can single step again. We can see, actually, if we want to reset and get back to our windows, uh, we can type in context and this will refresh all of our frames and get rid of everything else. The next instruction is going to move this large value into RAX. Cool, so I'm gonna type in single instruction and what's cool is uh, uh, Pwn Debug will also highlight any registers that just changed. So every time we step, RIP is going to increment because you know we're pointing at the next instruction. But we can see RAX also changed. And so RAX now contains this value that we just moved. And uh, Pwn Debug is also nice to tell us what it is in string. So it is hello world. So we're moving the string hello world. Uh, but it's doing it in two RAX instructions, which is pretty cool. Um, cool. So we can single step again. Uh, it just moved this value into EDX, cool. Uh, then it's gonna move RAX into this stack pointer and then RDX into this stack pointer. So we can do single step, single step. And now if we look at the stack, uh, we should see something cool. We see the string, hello world. So it is at the stack. If we didn't know what that string was, we can copy that address, copy. We can do examine slash string to see what string it is and we'll print it out. So cool. Again, we can use any of our old examine instructions again if we wanted. So if we wanted to look at the hex character, for example, we could do that. If we wanted to look at 10 hex characters, again, it's a string, so it's a little strange, but you know, we can see the first 10 characters. That's cool. If we wanted a large hex, so if we wanted like the full eight bytes of hex, you can do XGX and you get uh, this whole big hex string. Uh, this is what was moved earlier into RAX. It's just eight bytes of hex. Um, cool. Next, we're gonna be moving dead beef into third. So we've already kind of seen this before, but you can see it here, we're moving dead beef into EAX, and then it's gonna move uh, EAX or RAX. Um, EAX is the 32-bit register, RAX is a 64-bit register, uh, but they both point EAX also, you know, they, they overlap. Um, RAX contains EAX inside of it. It's just 64 bits and 32 bits. But then we move uh, RAX into a new stack pointer. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So next, uh, let's continue until this call to puts that's happening right here. Uh, what's cool uh, also with the uh, pwn debug is it shows you the arguments that are being passed when you call functions. So we're here, we're about to call puts, hi, what is your name? Puts actually accepts an RDI input, um, which is right here. And yeah, puts will be called. So there's two different things we can do at this point. We could do a single instruction and what's gonna happen is this will actually follow the puts call. So for this one, we'll do that. We're gonna do single instruction and now we can see we are in puts. We're technically in the PLT. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we'll skip through this. Uh, it's resolving. Let me do a quick finish. Um, oh, and it jumped out because it was resolving. Well, 
Uh, I used a command called finish in there. Uh, let me, uh, let's do it actually again. Uh, so I'm going to uh, continue to this gets call. So we're gonna do single instruction, single instruction, single instruction. We're gonna do a single step. Uh, I'm just gonna hit enter a bunch. So if I typed SS, SI once, so step single. Um, and then if you just press enter, it's gonna execute the last thing. So uh, there's a thing, a process, which we're gonna talk a lot about later uh, for um, how you resolve addresses in external libraries. So right now it's like looking up the uh, external library function. Um, we will talk all about this process in a bit. Uh, do, do, do. Actually, I'm gonna just speed this up. So I'm gonna do break gets. And so now when gets is called, we should hit a breakpoint. To continue to the next breakpoint, you type continue. So I'm gonna do a C. And now we are at gets. Again, it's doing all that resolving code. We're gonna talk about that later uh, in the global offset table and the PLT. Um, but basically there's a process that happens in the process, a process in the process for finding uh, addresses of external libraries. Uh, and it's just this lookup code. Um, it's not too important for right now. So anyways, I did a break gets, and then I just did continue. So it executed until the gets call. So now we're in gets. Um, and so we can continue, we can just do single instruction, we can just enter, 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 if we really were curious how this worked. We're not too curious, so what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna type finish. Finish will continue this function and finish until the, and just return to the next function. So we don't really care how fin or gets works, it's you know some library code. We're gonna type enter. Uh, gets expects user input. And so right now we typed in finish at the very bottom, but you can see it's waiting for something. So maybe I'll say SJP uh, hi. Cool. So it just finished. Um, couple things. Uh, we can see all the registers that were updated because of that call. We can see RAX because, because they're highlighted red. We can see RAX contains an address to SJP hi. Uh, cool. If we go down to the stack down here, we can see rex is also pointing to the stack address, which contains the SJP high. Uh, we can still see the end of world because um, we're overusing or we were reusing that same buffer. We can see dead beef is still there and 13 is still there. Um, and yeah, let's do a single instruction. Now we're going to call into func one. So let's do a single instruction. Uh, and now we're in a new function. So uh, we are in func one. We can do single instruction, single instruction, single instruction. Uh, right now at the beginning of every function, um, most functions just allocate and do some massaging for their own stack frame. Uh, so right now it's just creating room on the stack, uh, putting, getting everything together, ready for the rest of the function to execute. Uh, I'm gonna do a single instruction, single instruction, and now it's gonna do a puts call. It says, tell me something interesting. Uh, I'll do an N. Uh, we're gonna do a single instruction. We can see here we defined a buffer of eight bytes. Um, and, and now it's gonna do a gets on that buffer. So we're gonna do a quick little buffer overflow just to see what it looks like. Now it's gonna do that gets call. I'm gonna do an N and it should, oh, we have a break and gets. Uh, we no longer need that, that uh, breakpoint and gets. So I'm actually gonna delete it. Um, we can see we stopped here in gets and it's because breakpoint two was hit. So we're gonna do delete two so that it no longer stops when we get to the gets call. So delete two, uh, let's continue. Um, we allocated only eight bytes, so it should be possible to do a buffer overflow. We're just gonna try to corrupt the process. We don't really care too much, so I'm just gonna type in a whole bunch of A's just to see what happens. Actually, before I do that, um, we should do something. We are going to set another breakpoint right here. So I wanna see what happens when this function returns. So there's a couple different things I could do. I could just type finish a whole bunch and wait for it to return. And then we continue exiting function one, or we could set a breakpoint right here at func one plus 44. So if we remember, these are all the function frames. So when gets returns, it's gonna return right here. Uh, there's two different ways we could set a breakpoint here. Um, we can do break star at this address, which is nice. You can also do break star here at func one plus 44. Uh, they both work. Um, yeah, they're just two different ways. So now I'm gonna type continue, and now I'm gonna do my buffer overflow. Cool. Now uh, it, the gets call finished. We hit our breakpoint, which was right here. It was func plus 44, I guess. Um, now, uh, yeah, let's. we can see some stuff is a little bit weird. 
previously we had stack frames down here and now we can see all of our stack frames are is just a's <laughs> just a bunch of 61's so we know something here is wrong we can see there also used to be like stack information here but we can see it again it's just a so we just did a buffer overflow and we pretty much just clobbered everything so uh, it's going to do a couple of different things. We're going to load up a some arguments for a puts call. So I'm going to do single instruction, single instruction, single instruction. Cool. Uh, we don't care about puts, so we're just going to finish that. And now we are going to be exiting the function. So we're supposed to do a nop leave ret. So nop, no operation. Cool. Leave is going to pop off a uh, variable off the stack and put it into RBP. Um, unfortunately, the stack is all A's, so normally this would have been a stack address, but RBP just got clobbered with all A's. And next, uh, we're going to ret, and ret, when we call ret, what happens is it reads the next value off the stack, and it jumps to that location. And so it says it's going to try jumping to a location of all A's, uh, but obviously that doesn't make any sense. So when we do a single instruction, we get a sig seg, so uh, a seg fault. Um, yeah, pretty cool. So we exploited a buffer overflow. We can see what happens. It was just all A's. That address doesn't exist. It's not valid memory. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Um, we can also inspect the stack. So we could do stack 20, see what's going on. We can see it's pretty much just all A's. But if you wanted to look even further down, we can do stack 50. Uh, we can see, and we just have a whole bunch of stuff here. This is probably another stack frame uh, for, for earlier, libc start main, and then another start call. So there are more stack, stack frames, but they're just further down. Yeah, if you ever want to restart the process, you can just type run. And uh, there's also another handy tool, just print. Sometimes you need to do some math. Instead of opening up another terminal or a calculator, you can just do print OX3 minus 1, for example, and it'll print out the result. So I think it's common, like you'll need to know like the difference between, let's say, this stack address and this stack address. You can just do print and then subtract them out. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Again, there are a whole bunch of useful commands for Pwn Debug and GDB. Um, if you just do help all, you can see them. Uh, there's like almost too many. Um, <laughs> but because of that, I just, like I said, I just showed the ones that I think are most useful. We're going to be using a whole bunch more as we go through the rest of the video series. Uh, there's a lot of useful commands for the heap, uh, for the global offset table, for memory mapping. Um, just typing them out, like here's the global offset table, the memory mapping. We'll be looking at heap, uh, looking at bins. The heap isn't initialized because we're not using it. Um, yeah, there's a, we'll look at some telescoping, how to find chunks. Um, this, this tool is insanely amazing. And at some point in your CTF career, I'd highly recommend at least reading the docs for Pwn Debug uh, and just getting very familiar with GDB. Um, after a while, you're going to be using this on every CTF challenge. Um, anyways, that's it for this. Uh, starting in the next video, I think we're going to start using GDB uh, to write some exploits. So uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Cheers.